Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Zandi, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined, uh, as per usual, by my two co-hosts, uh, Ryan, Ryan Sweet, uh, Director of Real-Time Economics. Hi, Ryan. Hey, Mark. How are you? Good, good. Ryan's a little perturbed because he couldn't get his mic to work. I'm not sure what that's all about, but, you know. Me and technology know. just never works. Yeah, but that's okay. You, you're, you're coming through fine. I think uh, no big deal. Uh, so good to have you. And of course, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Dorides. Uh, Chris is the Deputy Chief Economist. Hi, hi Chris. How are you? Doing well. Good. Snowing I here in uh, Westchester. I heard. How much snow yeah. are you going to get? Uh, I think the estimate is anywhere from four inches to a foot. So. Ooh, that's a big range. That sounds like yeah. uh, Ryan's forecast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, only kidding. Ryan nailed it. No, I mean, yeah. You got the Q4 GDP pretty close, I thought, didn't you? You were like mm -hmm. at 6.4%. It came in at 6.9, right? Yep. That's and correct. I'm sure it's going to be revised down to 6.4. So, uh, you know. That's what I tell everybody. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, we'll come back to that. I want to I want to understand that that report a little bit more. I've got my own views, but I'm curious about yeah, how you're thinking about that. And we have a guest, uh, uh, Chad Chad Mutre. Chad is the chief economist. That's right, Chad, aren't you? You're the chief economist I of the National chief Association economist. of Manufacturers. Manufacturers. Yeah, very good. And how long have you been chief economist? I've been chief economist for almost eleven years, and so I'm chief economist at the NAM, but I also straddle over into the Manufacturing Institute, where I. I'm a center of one. I'm the center for manufacturing research. So, oh, well, what? What? I'm not. I'm sorry. I. What is the center for manufacturing? So, research? the Manufacturing Institute works on oh, workforce issues. It's more of the thought leader, non-advocacy type of stuff, and it really kind of stays in that workforce lane. And so, doing research uh, and thought leadership in that space. Great. Are you? Is that part of NAM, or is that a totally different thing? It's a separate legal entity. Uh, although, obviously, I have both hats, so I'm on both sides of the shop. Great. It, tell us. Uh, I'm really curious. How how does one become the chief economist of the National Association of Manufacturers? What's what's your path to fame and glory? So I I have kind of this secure, circuitous route to the current role. I, I actually started my career almost twenty something years ago as the dean of business at Robert Morris College. I was a uh, business school dean at 28 years old. Um, huh. uh, Robert awesome. Morris, if you are not familiar with it, used to be a secretarial school way back in the day and I was one of the first PhDs hired. So that was my first job out of getting my PhD at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Um, and lo and behold, I became dean after a year. <laughs> uh, uh, and I was dean for five years. And, and my claim to fame is I created the MBA program. Um, it is now, uh, fast forward, it is now part of Roosevelt University. So some M&A uh -huh. happening in, uh, in Chicago. Right. And, and then from there, I went on, as you know, Mark, I went on to be chief economist at the SBA. So I was at the US Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy for eight years from 2002 to 2010. Uh, I think we put out like 200 studies during that time. And was a, I was a talking head essentially on small business and entrepreneurship. Uh, my, my time came to an end. They had a new person that came in and, and uh, I was like, as, as it always happens in politics, I, I was said, you can stay till the end of the year and then uh, you're out of here. Uh, and I landed at the NAM, which, which is where I've been now for 11 years. So well, uh, nice, Chad, just nice a deep, transition. dark secret the, you, the, they do the same thing in the <laughs> private sector, too. Yeah. yeah so, you know, uh, but you, you, uh, Change that's in political wins and, and you, that's just what happens. That's so. just what happens. That's just what happens. So, uh, there is a, I think a pretty good nexus between small business and manufacturing, right? I mean, manufacturing is, you know, you got obviously big multinationals, but you got a lot of small manufacturers as well. So yeah, over 90% of our members are small and medium sized manufacturers. And so, uh, while you, while you can think of all of the big na names that we would have in our membership, uh, Many of the smaller ones you probably haven't, right? And yet they're the, they're the suppliers to those large OEMs, right? And so we, we have to pay attention to those pass-through issues as much as we do kind of the multinational and, and corporate issues. Yeah. Hey, what, just while, while, you, while you mentioned that, uh, I, I have noticed in the employment data, uh, the ADP employment data, we get this data from the human resource company and we can aggregate it up by company size. And it looks like that small businesses, those defined to be uh, uh, with fewer than 500 employees, in terms of jobs, they kind of held up better than the big guys. Uh, is that, 
your um, what you've observed in the manufacturing sector? Is that that tends to be true? I tend to, I tend yeah. to find it a little bit more for the medium sized manufacturers. They tend to be the most upbeat in my own survey that we do. Uh, the mm. smallest ones with less than fifty employees have have tended to, to struggle a little bit more. And mm. you've heard they don't have the scale uh, that some of the larger counterparts do. But yeah, I definitely think it's true for the medium size. Yeah, very interesting. Although there was a couple months there, I, I saw in your in your study where uh, large manufacturers actually had more job yeah. creation than than the small and medium. Well, ones. so that was a actually, bit of an aberration there for a couple months. So. Yeah, interestingly, I, and it may go back to the Paycheck Protection Program. That's the uh, the the program that was put in place with the CARES Act early on in the pandemic to help out companies with fewer than five hundred employees. You know, they get cash or they get a. Uh, they get money that turned into a to a grant if they use it to pay uh, to hold on to their payrolls, uh, and that seemed to have worked pretty well. And then you know after that program expired, which I believe was last summer, we did start to see some weakness there relative at, in small business employment relative to the big guys. The big guys started to catch up. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, great. So you've been at I didn't realize. Uh, uh, Na- you've been at NAM now for uh, 11 years. So you you have seen a lot of manufacturing history here, a lot of a lot of business cycles. When I began, we were talking a lot about the manufacturing renaissance. I think we got tired of using that word, uh, uh, just like we get tired of using the word uncertainty now, right? I think every year I've been at the NAM, we've talked about uncertainty. Um, and now, obviously, the skills gap and, and all the other uncertainty issues that are out there, the trade war, all right, at 20. 2018 right. and 2019 and then obviously the supply chain stuff now so yeah just lots of change over that time period yeah well we'll come back to all of that that's the yeah. you know obviously we want to dig deep into what's going on in the manufacturing ba- base and obviously no better person than you to do that with but before we get there you know chad and i know you're you you've listened into a couple of these podcasts we uh, talk about the statistics and the way we do this just to make it a little bit more digestible to the average person uh is to have a game play a game we each uh, name a statistic. The other folks try to figure out what that is by uh, questioning that person. The best statistic is one that is uh, uh, released recently uh, for Ryan, uh, Chris, and I. It has to be this past week. For you, it can be anything, Chad. If you're, if you, and you don't even have to play the game if you don't want to. I have uh, a number. But, I, okay, I've been, fantastic. I've been, I've been thinking about this. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. I, I knew I could count on you for a first for a statistic. Well, we also it also would be nice if the statistic is um, uh, not too hard that you know there's like no way to get it, but not too easy that it's a slam dunk. Uh, and if it's it, bonus, if it's relevant to the topic at hand, which is manufacturing, that's even better. So uh, I've gotten into the habit of starting with uh, Ryan because Ryan's so good at this. Uh, let's let's. Stay with tradition. Uh, Ryan, what, uh, what's your statistic? All right. There was a lot. Yeah. A lot of this numbers. Is a this very week. This active is, week. This was a great yeah. week. Yeah. But I'm going to go with 10.6% annualized. 10.6% annualized. Is that in the GDP report? It is. Is it investment? It's part Spending. of investment. Yep. Is it intellectual property investment? Yeah. Ding, right. ding, wow. ding, ding. Okay, wow. get that. Impressive. Come on. That was impressive. That was good. That, come on. That is yeah. like yeah. That's impressive. totally that impressive. Great... That All is, right. Uh, yep. That is Ryan Sweet. Hey, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Chad, what do you think? That was impressive. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm going I, for. Impressive. I was thinking it had to be a year of a year number or whatever. I mean, you know, no, anyway, you, you went right I, to it, Mark. That I, was great. That was know, good. I, I'm a, I'm a, um, a, bra, a, a Ryan Sweet Whisperer. I, you, okay. know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know what's in his I'm, head. That's good. I'm getting into his mind. Yeah, you are. A, You're starting. To, yeah, yeah. He can't get into my mind. That's like a. Yeah, you know, we'll see if he could. We'll we'll give him. A, I'm going to give him a good shot at that. Okay, Ryan, why did you pick that number? I'm just curious. Well, first, this is the uh, fourth uh, time in the past five quarters it's been double digit growth in intellectual property, hmm. and this relates to future productivity growth. So investment in intellectual property today will affect productivity growth down the road, which we know is the firewall between wages and inflation. Mm. So, you know, this above trend productivity growth that we're seeing is probably here to stay for, for some time. So what what is in intellectual property investment? What kinds of things go into that? Yeah, a good chunk of it is R&D. 
Hmm. And then there's, I believe there's software. Mm -hmm. So it's been really, really strong. Right. And do you think it's because businesses are focused on the need to raise labor productivity? That's Mm -hmm. what's going on here? Yep. Okay. Anything else driving that train? Is it maybe supply investments in supply chain, software related? Yeah, maybe work from home. So a work from home. Okay. That might be in there as well. And is there a strong relationship between investment in IP, intellectual property, and future productivity gains? It's decent. I wouldn't say it's like, you know, yeah. slam dunk, but it's it, historically it's been pretty, pretty solid. Okay. Well, now that I have you, uh, g- give us a general sense of that GDP number. So GDP came for Q4 2021 came out this week, big number, mm-hmm. 6.9%. For the year, big number, 5.7%. Um, so what's your take on the, the number and, you know, what it's saying about the economy? Well, Q4, Q4 wasn't great. Like that 6.9% is really distorted because inventories, and I, I don't want to give too many numbers because I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Chris. I think I'm going to steal his number. Okay. But if you strip out inventories, the economy grew only, uh, 1.9%. So it's a little bit misleading. I mean, 1.9, you know, it's it's okay, but it's not, you know, we weren't booming like close to 7% GDP growth as it looks like. I'm getting worried for the first quarter because that inventory build was massive and it's unlikely that we're going to be able to duplicate that. So we could get a little bit of a hangover in the first quarter of this year. But all in all, I mean, consumer spending was solid in the fourth quarter. But other than that, a lot of the details were kind of, kind of weak. So you got this big, you know, grandstanding close to 7% GDP number, but when you kind of dig down into the the bowels of the report, it looked worse and worse the more you dug. Yeah, I mean, so you're saying that obviously the top line number was gangbuster, 6.9% annualized, Mm -hmm. but that a big chunk of that, I think it was 4.9 percentage points of the 6.9 was just the swing in inventory that, you know, Mm -hmm. of course we need inventories because they got depleted and I think in Chad, correct me if I'm wrong, in manufacturing, they're still very, very lean in the manufacturing yeah, base. They are. Yeah. And the numbers on goods spending was not great. So the, the consumer spending yeah. was great for services, <laughs> but for 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 durable and non-durable goods, it was pretty, pretty weak. Overall business spending was pretty tepid as well, right? Outside right. of uh, intellectual property. So right. um, a lot of Omicron and supply chain worries there, I think kind of drug that figure down. Yeah, we got the monthly details today with the personal consumption data uh, and real spending is not on a great trajectory heading into the, to the first quarter. So you add that inventory is unlikely going to match what we got in the fourth quarter. And you know, our forecast, we have 2% GDP growth in the first quarter. I think that might be a little optimistic. Well, let me ask you this, because I was uh, uh, tweeting today. Oh, by the way, uh, here we go. At there Mark it is. Zandy, <laughs> Mark Zandy. Oh, and welcome, Ryan. I, I, I think mm-hmm. you had your inaugural inaugural uh, tweet this week. Did, I did. Did you not? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and now you're going to tell us what your tweet tweeter hint is. It Twitter, Twitter handle is. Twitter, Twitter, uh, Twitter, Twitter, it's Twitter. At real time underscore econ. Oh, okay. At what is real it? Time. At One real word. Real time underscore econ. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Hey, Chad, do you have a, a, a Twitter handle? I do. It's at Chad Mutre. So pretty simple. That's much easier I, I like that one. Yeah, I actually that like better. that. That's yeah. actually a little bit better. Yeah. Do you it's, tweet it's, a it's, lot? I Chad? do tweet a lot. I try to tweet. You know, I do a Monday economic report that goes out every week. I, I, it goes out to our members, but I also put up put it up pretty widely on social. Um, and during the week, I tend to tweet out some of those blurbs as well, including you know, today. I this morning, I, I tweeted out I follow you. I got to follow you. Okay. All right. Now I need to follow Ryan though. Yeah. I, Are you following I, me, Chad? I do. I do. Okay. And I don't know, Chris, do I, I might follow you as well. I don't know, but. Oh, are I you actually on? tweet? I'm, uh, well, Chris doesn't that. lead, so I don't know what you're following. exactly. Uh, okay, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I know that that actually that is but very LinkedIn. characteristic of me. Yeah. LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn, Li- LinkedIn. Chris is like, I'm all over it. He runs the show there on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, that's great. So you said you tweeted today? I, I missed I that. Did. I did. The yeah. GDP and PCE and all that fun stuff. Oh, uh, right. Plymouth, Plymouth Cost yep. Index, et cetera. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. Good. Hey, okay. It feels like to me that 
Q1 could actually turn out to be negative uh, GDP. I mean, the Omicron is doing some damage. December was a really bad month, right? All the data seemed to suggest it was a bad month. Retail sales, um, unemployment insurance claims, you know, uh, the, the consumer spending data we got today, the income data we got today. Uh, and uh, it feels like January employment, which we're going to get next week, Friday is jobs day next Friday. Good chance that's negative. You know, we yeah. actually lost jobs in January. It's a very good chance. Yeah, yeah, very good chance. So, you know, what are the odds that we're actually going to get a negative Q1 GDP number, do you think, Ryan? Well, remember you asked me about Q4 GDP. What are the odds of it falling? And I said zero. Well, that was like three months ago when we yeah. had Kevin Q1. on. Kevin Hassett, the former CEA. Oh, well, it was a great interview. He's such a great guy, but he got that wrong, obviously. He was... He was think, thinking it was going to be a negative Q4, but I think he was off by one quarter. So I think one, the odds I think he was are, off by one quarter. Yeah, right. I think odds are pretty high that we see a decline because that five percent or four point nine percentage point contribution to GDP growth from inventories yeah. is among the highest since the early 1980s. Like that's yeah. going to be really, really difficult to. I mean, we need inventories, but you know, with Omicron supply chain issues not really getting resolved too quickly. Yeah, I, I'd probably say it's. Probably, I would say probably better than even odds that it falls. Better than even odds that wow. it falls. Okay. Mm-hmm. We, we still got February yeah. and March, you know. Yeah. Game's not over. <laughs> yeah. It has to bounce yeah, back but, pretty strong, though. I mean, it we does, dug ourselves does. a deep hole in January, though. I, yeah. I agree. I agree. Hey, hey, Chad, do you do explicit GDP forecasts in your work? Is that part of what you do? I do. And we subscribe to Moody's Analytics. And so uh, I'm looking at what you're doing a lot as well. But yes, I, I do. Yeah. And, and do you have a sense or do you have any views yet? Have you thought about Q1 at all, whether that's going to be possibly I negative? I haven't been as negative as Ryan, but you guys are depressing me here. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I, I suspect that, that you're starting to see Omicron waning a little bit here. And, and I think you're going to start seeing a bit of a return in, in February and March, whether that's enough to overcome the weakness that you're seeing in January or, or the weakness in the in inventories. I, I, I don't know, but I, I, I don't actually don't think it's going to be negative for the first quarter, but um, maybe that's just the, the cautious optimism in me. Yeah. I mean, the other if thing it's not it's negative, going, it's going to be yeah. weak. It's yeah. going to be south of one. For sure. Yeah. 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 Well, cause the other thing that's happening now is financial conditions are tightening, right? I mean, the mm-hmm. equity market decline, we're down, I didn't. I don't know what's going on today, but it feels like we're about down down ten percent on the S and P, aren't we? Something like that. So close to. Uh, it. Of course, that's yeah. after thirty percent gain last year. So, but still, uh, yeah, bond yields are up. That's hitting refinancing activity and kind of starting to feel it in the housing market. If you're you know paying attention, the pending home sales, that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. right, yeah. But I guess what we're saying here is, uh, you know, that's not great. Nobody likes to see a negative print on GDP. But don't get overly concerned, oh. right? Because as the Omicron passes through, we if you know history's any guide here, we come right back, you know, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, we're still. I would it feels like we're still pretty optim. I'm still pretty optimistic about what's going to happen in 2022 in terms of growth. Yeah. Yeah, we, we might get a first uh, or a weak first quarter, but then the second quarter would be very very strong. Right. So yeah, just like yeah. Delta, like yeah. crushed us in Q3 and then look at Q4. Okay. All right. Uh, let's, uh, Chris, you want to go next? You know, what's your, uh, what's sure. your statistic? I'm going to give you a twofer. They're related. A twofer. a twofer for housing. 17% and five days. Ooh, that's interesting. 17%. Housing related? No. 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 Not housing I, related. I follow the rules here. You know, it's related to our topic of the day. <laughs> oh, related to manufacturing. Related to manufacturing. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, a report came out this week. A report that came out this week. Is uh, it good spending year over year? Nope. No. Is this in durable goods? Nope. Uh, it is was it a related? report. It was a report. So it's not a regular. Statistic. Oh, it's not a statistic. It's not an economic it is a statistic. statistic. It is. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, right. It's not a. Uh, it's not a monthly release or anything. Okay. It has something to do with Department of uh, Commerce report. Chi- oh, chip chips. Chips. Semiconductors. And it's the number of days supply of chips. 
five days is the number of days supply of chips down from 40 days prior to the pandemic. So wait, we are on. Wait, before you explain anything, oh, yeah. Ryan, get the cowbell out, my friend. Well, what about the 17%? Oh. I think you uh, guys are in cahoots because there is no way. How did you know that? I know stuff, it was, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> I just know stuff. That is outrageous. What you about the 17%? Cahoots? Uh, well, the 17% there? is, uh, actually, I don't know what the 17% is. Uh, that is the increase in demand for uh, semiconductors from 2019 yeah. to today, 2020. No, no. Can, can I ask? Well, I didn't hear the cowbell. Where the hell is the cowbell? I just did it. Did, did you, Chad, <laughs> yeah, did he do the cowbell? I, I, okay, I, there we go. All right. <laughs> I, I am on a roll. I am on a roll, baby. That was very good. Uh, okay. Now, because I, I didn't read the report. I, you know, I read of the report, um, the 17% increase over what period is that? That is, I'm, I have the report right here. Yeah. 2019 to 2021. Calendar year? Well, is that calendar year 2021? Uh, well, that's I, only I, because you see what I'm saying? That's yeah, it doesn't account. It, I'm sure it, it came out. I don't know that it uh, fully accounts for the year. It doesn't give okay. you the detail. But it's it's some twenty twenty one over twenty nineteen, so pre pandemic, yeah. it's up seventeen percent. Yeah, I okay. don't know if that's an average. In the, or a... in the five days, uh, as of what point in time, we have five days of chip supply on hand. Uh, if I'm stating that correctly, correct. Uh, that's the median inventory of uh, semiconductors in twenty twenty one. Again, the report. Uh, okay. Okay. In the, year, in the year, sometime in the year. So yeah, it has nothing to say about like averaging. right now what's going on. No, I that yeah, that's my impression. It's not the yeah, it's not as of December. It's right as of the year. I think it was uh, conducted on a survey basis. Right, right. Hey, Chad, uh, does that that resonates with you? Those statistics in the in the, what's going on in manufacturing? Well, definitely. Um, I know you had GM's chief economist on last week, right? And so, you know, the chip Brunker, shortage, yeah, yeah the, the, the chip shortage certainly is hitting the auto sector hard, but, but, you know, a lot of products have chips in them, right? Not just, not just autos. So we're seeing those, those shortages, you know, kind of across the board. Um, and that's certainly affecting their ability to produce. And uh, I mean, I think, you know, the, the good news is to kind of drift into where we might go later, uh, you know, the CHIPS Act, and you're seeing a lot of investments, you know, just last week, I think Intel announced a huge $20 billion investment in Ohio, right? So uh, a lot of other companies, Samsung, et cetera, are, are making similar uh, investment announcements. So that hopefully, you know, will help out in 2023 and 2024. Doesn't really help the short term here, but um, certainly for, for here and now, it's a big issue. Yeah. Do you, do you sense, like when Elaine, we were talking with Elaine last week, again, the chief economist of GM, she she generally was, I thought, upbeat about the chip, about shortages in general, the supply shortages in general, and the chip, she was making the point that chip production is up significantly in the fourth quarter globally, and it's starting to have an impact on the ability of vehicle manufacturers around the world to produce more cars, and you know, she sounded you know encouraging to me. Ryan, uh, Chris, do you, did you have the same sense of that conversation that, that was relatively upbeat? Yeah, yeah, and I think you see some. I think the Japanese manufacturers actually uh, had a, a pretty good December in terms of their production. So I, yeah. I think she's right. I think we are starting to see that come back online. But we appear to have turned a corner there. Yeah, yeah. And, and you see the same lean. thing, Chad. Yeah. Do you sense yeah. the same thing more broadly in the manufacturing base, or just? In general, yeah, in I think, general, I think yeah. You're, yeah, yeah, I think it's, okay. it's still one offs there are, are still big issues. Yeah. And I think Tim Cook, I, I saw the, the Apple CEO uh, started to, also suggested that some of the supply chain issues seem to be ironing themselves out and it helped out in terms of their activity in the fourth quarter. So it feels like we're moving in the right direction. Okay, it does. It certainly yeah. highlights a vulnerability, though, right? To Chad's point, everything has a chip in it, right? So, uh, yeah, this is a really important issue, and with so many of the chips of the higher end chips coming out of Taiwan, it, you know, it's a key uh, strategic or geopolitical um, yeah. risk as well. Side of chips, we just ordered a new set of living room furniture, and, uh -huh. and we were told it will come here sometime in four to seven months. So it's not just it's <laughs> no. not just yeah. right? we're waiting for, uh, those supply chain issues are huge outside of other uh, you know chips and cars. So.
Yeah. Well, let's come back to that. Um, yeah. Anything else, Chris, on that report uh, from the Commerce Department on what's going on in the chip industry? Oh, it's a really interesting report. It's very, uh, it's for the general public, right? So it's, it's, it's a very easy uh, read if anyone wants to take a look at it. But uh, just, again, I thought uh, the, the points about the interconnection and how, you know, the chips are designed in the U.S. and manufactured in Southeast Asia and just all those, uh, all those things have to go right in order to get the, the chip production. So it's, I thought it was a good report of, in terms of highlighting the complexities of solving this issue, why it's why it is something that we can't resolve immediately and it may linger uh, for a bit longer. Yeah. Did, did they do any kind of forecasting in the report? Like, no, it was okay. No, they talked about some of the investments that are proposed yeah, some here, of the investments. but still yeah. that there would be a, li uh, a lag uh, to get up a, a new fabrication plant, right? It's not something you can turn around uh, within a month or two. It's years take, in the making. Take some time. Yeah. Well, someone else was making the point. Uh, it was Tim Way, uh, one of our economists who uh, tracks the supply chain issues and really is focused on uh, the chip industry, that uh, a lot of the shortages are for kind of lower value added chips, that that's where the, the uh, most significant constraints are. Did that come through in the report as well? Uh, they didn't. Really, I didn't see much Talk about that. About okay. that. But yeah. OK. I wouldn't doubt okay. that, though. Yeah. OK. Uh, hey, Chad, you want to play the game? I do. So I have an easy one and a hard one. Which would you like? Uh, All right, give Mark the hard one because I don't think we've had it. <laughs> okay. We've never had anyone go three for three. I don't think. That's okay. true. The, the pressure give is Mark, on. Uh, Mark the hard one. Start with our, let's, let's start with the easy one. So, sure. so these are both. The, you want the easy first? Uh, okay. Let's go with the easy one first because it's probably okay. hard. But go ahead. Four point one percent. Is that year over year? Uh, it is a year over year number. Yeah. And uh, is that both of these numbers are manufacturing? So um, oh, I know. I think I know what it is. The is it? Uh, wage growth for manufacturing in the ECI employment yep. cost. Okay. Okay. From oh this morning. my gosh! This is yeah, like three. incredible. Oh, wow. What's going <laughs> on here today? I told you that this was is... an easy one, Mark. Yeah. Uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> easy. Ryan had no idea what that statistic. I was. knew that one. Oh come the on. The employment cost. In the... Yeah. Um. It came out today. <laughs> I was just going to let you have your moment in glory. Oh, lordy, lordy, lordy. Ring the cowbell. Okay, here we go. Yeah, we go. Cowbell ring. Okay. Oh. This is I am. This is like I am on fire, baby. Unprecedented. Unprecedented. Okay. Uh, well, before you move on to the hard one, what, well, what, what do you think of that number, that 4.1%? What, what do you think? Well, it was a record high for the ECI, which has only been around since 2001. Um, uh, and we'll probably get to this a little bit later in our, our larger conversation, but we, I, we continue to hear from manufacturers that they, the struggle for talent is, is real, right, in the local communities. And in our survey, it was 3.8 was the average. Uh, and, and I would present that to our, some of the CEOs and they'd say, yeah, we wish it was 3.8. It's, it's actually probably like five or more, right, uh, in, in some cases for some cities. So definitely a lot of, of, of struggle for workers right now. They're having to compete against the service sector, right? Which is paying even more than that, right? Uh, in some cases, on a year-over-year -year basis. So, that's a that's a pretty significant increase. Yeah, here's you know, there's uh, I have and this is a little broader point around the wages. I'm, I'm a little confused about that. I'm just curious if anyone has a view on. You know, everyone uh, you know uh, likes the employment cost index, the ECI. That's the number you just the uh, wage number yes. you just uh, you know put forth. And they like it because it controls for shifts in the composition of the labor force. So, uh, you know, in terms of uh, industry, in terms of occupation, I think it even has, it's even more detailed than that within occupation that controls for, you know, mix. So it's kind of a, you know, apples to apples over time measure of wage growth, which is, you know, important, different than other measures. Uh, the one other uh, wage statistic that does that in a, in a different way, but does it is the Atlanta Fed wage tracker based on, I think, CPS data. Hopefully they can continue to do this because I think the BEA is thinking about uh, stopping provisioning of this data, but we'll can talk about that. But anyway, tracking the same worker uh, and seeing what their wages are doing. And if you look at that, wage growth has picked 
if you look at the ECI, that the Employment Conscious Index that came out, that shows a market acceleration in, in weight, broad based uh, broad based acceleration in wage growth. Ryan, what was the top line number for all across the across the board? Was it was it five percent or something for year all over work? year? Year over year, what was it? I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was close to five. It was close to four. Four it was one. Yeah, I think it was close to five year over year. And but if you look at the Atlanta Fed wage tracker, it, it has accelerated, but not nearly to the same degree. Uh, at least through, I think the last data point I saw was for November, or maybe December's out now, and I haven't taken a look. But any any Ryan or anybody any sense of the differences there? Why why it's such a big difference? Do you know? Do you have any sense of that? No. Ryan, do you have any sense of that? I remember looking in this a while ago. So yeah. I got to dig back. I got to remember what we found out. There's okay. there's, there's a little quirk because uh, we have a wage tracker. And basically what we do is we take all the uh, most popular measures of, of wages. So average hourly earnings, uh, ECI, uh, uh, unit labor cost, the Atlanta Fed, and we mash them all up together and create this this wage tracker. Uh, and we have to make an adjustment. I got to remember why we did make an adjustment to the Atlanta wage, but I can get back to you next week about it. Yeah, I'm just really curious. Uh, I mean, if you look at that Atlanta Fed, and the reason I like the Atlanta Fed data is because it breaks it out by different demographics. You know, you can look across region, you can look across industry, you can look across uh, full time, part time, job holders versus job switchers. And the thing I really look at is uh, wage growth by uh, way, where you are in the wage distribution, and you can see all of the all of the acceleration in wage growth is in the folks in the bottom half of the wage distribution, and particularly in the bottom quartile, the bottom twenty five percent of the wage distribution. The folks in the top half of the, of the wage distribution have not seen any acceleration, and if anything, it feels like it's decelerated a little bit. You know, particularly for the highest wage workers. So uh, that just seems a bit incongruous with the ECI, which feels like the wage growth is a lot, uh, acceleration has been much more broad based. But I'm, so I'm just curious how, we got to figure out how, I, w I would love to square, you know, that, those differences, you know, what's, what's going on because it, they're telling different stories at this point. So not completely different stories, but in, certainly in kind, they're, they're very different, but okay. That's average, good one. So, hourly, average hourly earning or ever, average hourly earnings for production workers is also about a 40 year high, 5.2. So that also wouldn't necessarily I guess square with yeah. accelerating activity from from the Atlanta Fed. Right, because so. manufacturing wages definitely aren't in the bottom quartile; they're kind of in the middle, well, the high part of the distribution. Twenty-four right? bucks an hour, yeah, 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 twenty-four bucks workers. an hour. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, okay, so uh, Chad, you said you had a hard one. So I put on my old hat. This is a hint. Uh, two point two, yeah, two point two percent. Two a number point, that came out this week. It came out this week. Yeah. So small business, something uh, related to small business, business employment dynamics data. Oh, oh. Business employment dynamics data. I have and not. I, I did not look at that one. data. That is, uh, you said two point two percent. Two point two percent. And um, is it? Uh, are you? So you're saying it has something in the business employment dynamics related to small business up two point two percent year over year? Mm -hmm. No, quarter to quarter. Uh, it's just a percentage of of all. Of oh, yeah. percentage of. Yeah. Oh. Related to manufacturing. Yes. Just, hmm. Hmm. Do you know, Chris? If I get this, you guys, you know, you got a bow Jenny flucked to me. I, mean, <laughs> I think that's a word. All right, give me a second. Okay, we'll give you a second. I told you this right. was a hard. This was a harder. I was trying to think of a hard one and an easy one, and I did. So it's like that Jeopardy it's a hard one. D, yeah. D, 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 this is this is a great uh, data set to look at, but it's yeah. got you know hiring separate uh, layoff. Yeah, yeah. This it's is huge. Wait, is this startups? It is, startups. It is startups. Uh, Manufacturing oh. startups. That's right. You are right, Ryan. It, but what's the two point? Is that as a share of total startups? So this is the second quarter. So there's a huge lag in, in all these data. Yeah. So it, there were seven thousand manufacturing startups in the second quarter. Which is two point two percent of all manufacturing establishments, and oh, that was oh, that was the highest since the first quarter of nineteen ninety eight. That is a great statistic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So much and, and, like much like you're seeing increased entrepreneurship 
across the board during the pandemic. You're also seeing it in manufacturing. Unfortunately, it doesn't go any more detail to know like where are they starting and what's what, but but it's a nice it's a nice fun statistic. Yeah. So the employ business employment dynamics. I'm trying to think of what is the underlying source data. Is that the Q is it QCW quarterly census of employment and wages? Pro I don't know. Is it okay? It's, yeah. So kind yeah. of the unemployment insurance record data, and the here the, in this data they is quarterly. It's lag because there's a lot of processing that goes on. It shows uh, it shows increases in employment and uh, uh, declines in employment. And they, they break it out in terms of new businesses, uh, how much they're hiring, uh, how much hiring is going on in existing businesses. It gives you a lot of detail, a lot of, you it's know, the so existing you want to, businesses, it's whether they're expanding or, you know, you yeah, know, all that fun stuff. So. so you can get under the hood and see what's really driving the employment data. You know, what, what, why is it doing what it's doing? This really helps with that. And, and your, did you look more broadly, Chad? Uh, is, did you notice uh, whether uh, business formation is up? across the board or was that just pretty much? I didn't, I didn't in this yeah. case. Um, I think in general, you know, business applications are up pretty yeah. significantly. Although you've seen that pull back a little bit here in the last couple of months, but you know, yeah. around October, it was all a record high or something like that. So yeah. it, it, you've seen a pretty significant increase in entrepreneurship. Uh, so so how do you explain it? What's, you know, what's behind this, this surge in entrepreneurship, new business formation in manufacturing? Well, in general, I'll say in general first. In general, uh, okay. Uh, in general, you tend to you, people lose their job, right? And or, or they're looking for you know, people are reevaluating their work life balance in this case with the pandemic and saying, hey, rather than working, you know, in a factory or whatever else, I'm going to go out and start my own job. And that's that's why you tend to see, especially in recessions or or kind of times of economic unease, more entrepreneurship. In manufacturing, it's just easy to start up. A job, right? I mean, it, it, you're coming up with new innovations. You're coming up with a new. It's easy to start a, a business, right? And so I suspect that you're seeing some kind of tag along. Uh, maybe people who used to work in manufacturing who've come up with a new idea. They're going to go out and market it now, and maybe become a supplier themselves. I guess. Technology, I'm sure, is a big part of this conversation, right? Um, again, I don't know a lot about those companies necessarily to know who is who it, who it is. I think that, yeah. that would be a great study to kind of go in and see who are the new entrepreneurs, but I suspect there's a lot in the pharmaceutical or technology or uh, in that kind of space. Do, do, you ha do you have a sense that it's broad based in manufacturing or is, do you think it is concentrated in like pharma and tech and I suspect it's more concentrated, more yeah. concentrated, right? That's just a guess on my part. Yeah. Although you make a great point, which we've talked about in the past on these podcasts. If you look at the, uh, taxpayer identification uh, data from coming from the IRS, which is a good read on business formation, that's been up very strongly over the past year, and that is broad based. That's across yeah. every industry, I think almost every region of the country. So it is consistent with that. At Ryan, Chris, yeah. do you have any other any sense as to what could be driving the increase in entrepreneurial activity, other than the things that kind of Chad mentioned? Any, any other views on that? I had a more of a question or yeah, uh, far observation away. more on the, I was wondering if uh, you had any sense in terms of who might be starting this business. Is it the old, right? We see that uh, 55 plus age workers are exiting the labor force at higher numbers, but if they're going to start businesses, that's, that's actually positive. Maybe we, yeah. maybe we should reevaluate the data somewhat. So do you think yeah. it's more the older worker who's kind of branching out or is it I think it's probably a little bit of everything, but I, I definitely, there's definitely been increased retirements, as you know, Chris, uh, right, right. Uh, and uh, they can come back and maybe work part-time or work back as, come back as a consultant, right? Uh, and that would be an example of, of I guess, a ma manufacturing consultant would still be in that next code, right? So yeah. It could or be if they're starting that. businesses, then yeah, you know, yeah. certainly they're yeah. creating positions for others. Yeah. You know, the, I, it, I don't think it's uh, like proprietorships, right? Because self-employed, the number of people that are self-employed hasn't increased all that much i don't think it, right so these are these are real companies i mean these are they're incorporating you know or partnerships uh so it's not like a, a, somebody losing their job and just putting out a shingle and say hey you know i'm starting a company it feels more substantive than that right or do i have it that wrong it probably is but i think it's also self-reported right so if you are mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, you could report that you're 31 to 33, right? Uh, yeah. If you're, if that's who you're supporting, right? Uh, and and no one's going to question you on it. So yeah, got it. 
Yeah. yeah that's, that, was, that was a great statistic. Very good one. Yeah. And I'll point out the only one I did not get. Uh, so uh, just send. That was Ryan. That was Ryan. That was Ryan who got that. Way to go, yeah. Ryan. Good job. Good job. All right. I, Mark, I, I've got. This is this is your strongest showing ever. Uh, so, I've, far. Oh, I've far. had a couple showings over the year. Uh, this is this has got to be up there. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely up there. I'm I'm very proud of my performance so far today. So I'll have to say. <laughs> so what you um, have? What, what do you have? Oh. Uh, this should not be hard, uh, you know, just prefacing it that way. Uh, so, uh, I'd be a little surprised if, you know, we have difficulty with this one. 4.9%, 4.9%. And it is a statistic that came out this week. Uh, and is it related to manufacturing? It is not related directly yeah. to manufacturing. No. So I don't get the bonus points for that and it's not a year over year number it is a year over year number yes it is indeed yep you know it's kind of gdp been... report or... gdp report uh no no uh it has been obviously top of mind kind of like everyone's so inflation in. inflation very good okay and very, yeah, very good uh, that, now this should be easy yeah what uh, came, came up are you sure it came out this week? Core PCE. Yeah. Core PCE. Oh, very oh, good. Came, oh, yeah. Not this week. Are you kidding me? It came out two hours ago, my friend. I know. <laughs> yeah. And I wrote the release on our site. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you really? Uh -huh. oh. The highest yeah. is 83, I believe. That That is right. The core so PCE, that's the consumer expenditure deflator. Uh, and core meaning X food and energy. This is this the uh, one inflation measure that the Fed focuses on the most uh, in terms of trying to set or think about, you know, the, where interest rates should be in the course of monetary policy. And 4.9% is, you know, they, they want two, uh, you know, they're back down to two. So this is, you know, obviously well, well above uh, 2%. Uh, you know, my sense is that um, it, it's at or near a peak, although I say that with less confidence as I, as I would have a few weeks ago as energy prices are up again which is not a good thing. Um, uh, but, uh, but it feels like we're at or near a peak, particularly if the supply chain issues uh, are ironing themselves out, labor market certain to iron themselves out after Omicron passes through. But I think that's an important statistic, you know, to, to focus on. So uh, do I get a cowbell? Is it, did I hear yeah, it? Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah. You definitely get a cowbell. That, okay. Yeah. Way to go. <laughs> Excellent. Great job. That's very um, good. Okay, uh, before we kind of dive in, I have one other question uh, around monetary policy, because, you know, this was also the week that the Federal Reserve met, and uh, we got a, another read on what they're thinking. And Ryan, do you want to give us just a kind of a summary of sort of where they landed at the FOMC meeting, the Federal Open Market Committee meeting this week? Yeah, so they used the January meetings to tee up a rate hike uh, in March. So they're very likely going to start uh, normalizing monetary policy with regards to interest rates in March. Uh, and they really didn't push back against you know, market pricing, which is betting on four rate hikes this year. That's what's in our forecast. Uh, but the general takeaway is that they have a zero tolerance for any upside surprises in inflation. So if we start to see you know, inflation running hot early this year, four hikes turns into five. Uh, but all in all, there wasn't a lot of surprises in the meeting. I, we knew they were going to tee it up for March. Uh, quantitative tightening is going to start one to two meetings. Uh, and that's quantitative tightening is a reduction in the size of the balance sheet. Uh, one or two meetings after the first rate hike. So March, raise rates. Uh, July, probably start letting the balance sheet run off. But they're clearly really worried about uh, inflation. Uh, and that's why they're going to start you know, pushing uh put their foot on the uh, the break this year. I, I read, and I'm, I'm just curious if, I'm, if this is right, that the uh, market, the financial markets, the uh, investors are pricing in uh, nearly five quarter point mm -hmm. rate increases this year. Is that right? Yeah, it's not fully priced in, it's close. But, uh -huh. and I'd say four is the most likely scenario. But, but markets have seemed to have even gone beyond that at this point. Mm -hmm. They're almost yep. at five. Right. Yeah, and I think part of it was Powell, uh, Fed Chair Powell, uh, in his post-meeting presser was very, very hawkish. Like, 
they pulled it off with the statement. You know, they got their point across that, you know, rates are going to rise soon. Markets, there was a, a little bit of a, re, a relief rally. And then Powell started speaking and, you know, it was very, very hawkish. And, and that clearly rattled markets. And I think that's what's contributing to them penciling in maybe a fifth rate hike. So it feels weird, doesn't it? I mean, here we were talking about employment declining in January, GDP falling in the first quarter, uh, and yet we're you know we're on on the high alert with regard to short term interest rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, does that feel it's, like thing? You think there's a risk that the, there people are getting ahead of themselves here on these rate hikes? Or, the number, yes. I think they're yeah. going in March no matter what. Yeah. Like they've already teed yeah. that up. Uh, teed that you know, up. Even, they'll play off January, even if employment you know declines in February, which is unlikely. But yeah, they'll just say it's Omicron, it's temporary. Things are going to bounce okay. back, uh, and they're they're laser focused on these inflation uh, numbers. And Powell has no tolerance, so he's going to start uh, clamping down. Yeah, there's a, I, there's a lot of pressure um, from consumers. You saw consumer confidence fall today to a ten year low. Uh, Certainly in our survey, it's the number one issue. I think there's just a lot of pressure right now to deal with inflation. Mm -hmm. Everyone's talking about it, right? Real wages essentially are negative, right? At this point, even with those 40 year highs that, that I just talked about earlier. So I think there's a lot of pressure for policymakers to do something about this. And so, uh, so yeah, I think March is on the, in the it's gonna happen as well. Kind of yeah. Well, in your forecast, uh, Chad, do you, do you now have four rate increases this year or what do you yes. have? I have you four. Do. Yeah. You have four. Yeah. Kind of one, yeah. one a quarter you know, yeah. going forward. Yeah. I think, wasn't it Jamie Dimon who came out and said that there's going to be seven over the next year and a half or something like that. So I think that also is in the people's, the back of people's minds as well. But, but I think, yeah, four for, for this year. Oh, I missed that. I didn't hear him say that. So seven, so that's kind of one, one a quarter, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and that's what we think they're going to do. Chad, is that what they should do? Are you on board with that? I think the Fed is behind the curve a little bit. Now, granted, that's what's happening now is, is perhaps changing that calculus a little bit, but uh, they clearly it, the inflation right now is to the level that they, they clearly are behind the curve and they feel like they have to do something. So yeah, I, I think, yes. Yeah, and you, Ryan, are you, you shook your head in the other, you said no, you, you don't think, no. this, what do you think? What do you think? They should wait. Wait for what? Wait. There's no, there's no rush. Oh. Inflation's going to moderate. So oh, they, oh, okay. People, all right. So I, 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 view, I have a, I sympathize with the view that they're behind the curve when you have inflation where it is now, but it's going to moderate uh, this year. So there's the potential that they tighten too fast, too soon, and they undermine the uh, labor market. Now, what really rattled financial markets was when Powell said that we could raise rates a lot, and he said a lot before we hurt the labor market. And I don't buy into that. I think, you know, you know, we're at zero, we can get up to two, but you know, I think they, they gotta do this gradually. I'm afraid they're they're gonna slam their foot on the brake. Right. So your your instinct now is that they should not be raising rates as quickly. They they should wait till what, May, June, see what Yeah, June. Yeah, June. Yep. Interesting. Okay. Because by June they, inflation will be moderating a lot. Yeah. Chris, do you have a view? Yeah. Uh, some, somewhat sympathetic, sympathetic to Ryan's view. <clears throat> yeah. I think, uh, I think they will hike in March because mm -hmm. they've already, it would be a mistake at they this point not it. to. Yeah, yeah. If they don't, it's going to be more destructive. Yeah. Um, but then I do believe that inflation is going to roll over here and kind of fade from the scene. I, 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 at least that's one of my key assumptions. And so, right. Or that, and I think there are a lot of other risks that are out there that, you know, Ukraine, Taiwan, yeah, another wave of, of, um, of the pandemic. I think there are enough factors out there that uh, they're not going to be able to uh, race as quickly. So I, I'm penciling in three personally. But, uh, three, oh, you, you think there'll be three rate increases? Yeah. yeah. Just okay. because there's so, so, many, so many other factors here. Yeah. And I think the inflation actually is going to, the supply uh, effects are going to well, I think really the great. I think Chair Powell used the word nimble too, right? Which I think and humble, which I think yeah. really you know applies. I mean, because yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll just have to see how this goes. Yeah, yeah. So it's just jawboning then. Yeah, in the, in exactly. the presser. Right? Yeah.
Right. Okay. Hey, let's turn to the uh, topic at hand in manufacturing. And I, I want to preface, we, there's a lot to talk about, but I, one thing I want to start off is kind of a big picture. And I was doing a little bit of preparation you know, before, before this for our conversation. And I noticed industrial production, so that's in manufacturing, so just focused on output in the manufacturing uh, base, you know, it goes up and down all around with the business cycle, no surprise. And, and it is back up, you know, it got creamed at the teeth of the pandemic a couple of years ago, and but it's made its way back and kind of back to where it was pre-pandemic, maybe a little bit higher. But it really hasn't gone anywhere for almost, I don't know, 20 years. I mean, you know, if you can go back to the end of the cycle leading into Y2, the Y2K bubble bursting, you know, the tech bubble when that burst, you know, 1999, 1998, industrial production is just about back to where that was, you know, it really hasn't gone anywhere in 20 years. Is that a, uh, does that, is that a, uh, Chad, a, a fair characterization of the reality of what's been going on in the manufacturing base? You mentioned manufacturing renaissance, but yeah. you just don't see it in that data. I don't think you see it in that data because um, that's an index. Uh, but when you look at the, the overall data from the BEA, when you look at real value added, right? Uh, real value added actually has been all time highs, right? Uh, for, for much of the last couple you know, quarters, right? So you are seeing more output in general in the manufacturing sector, not just in a nominal way, but also on a real, on a real kind of price adjusted way. way. Uh, and so I actually think the manufacturing continues to hit on all cylinders. I think what's really hurt it over the last couple of years has been the trade war. And then obviously the kind of the, this pandemic supply chain issues over the last year or so. Um, what, I, what I like to say is, is manufacturing demand actually is pretty strong right now. Again. Uh, let's take December kind of uh, uh, the disappointing number we're getting in December and January out of it. In general, manufacturing demand has been pretty strong. I think the, the challenge for the sector when I talk to them uh, is that uh, being able to meet that demand has been the challenge, right? Uh, with some of those capacity issues. Right. Uh, right. But, I, but I, you know, you're, you were, you're seeing overall, I think in terms of real output, uh, continued growth over that time period. Right. So the, the IP, the industrial production numbers index that comes from the Fed, which is supposed to be a measure of real output, right? That's what that's supposed to be. You're saying that that probably is not capturing the reality of what's going on here. That's my view. I mean, again, yeah. you can look at different numbers there. But um, yeah, but, uh, but if you look at real value added, which is also another measure of output, that's in dollar terms, you know, like $2012. Yeah. It, I didn't look at that. You're saying that is up. And real right. exports we're an all time high, like before the trade war, we're still not, we're not far from, you know, we weren't far from that before, before the pandemic as well. So I think in general, out, when you're looking at other measures like, the, like overall output or exports, you clearly see that the manufacturing sector ha had been certainly over the longer term growing and getting bigger. Um, and, and, and in my view, getting more productive, right? Like we have 12.5, you know, 12.6 million workers right now. We had, you know, almost 20 million, obviously, at, at kind of at its peak. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're certainly getting, doing a lot more with less. Uh, and so I think you, you have that debate quite a bit about, you know, is manufacturing shrinking or not shrinking or getting, you know, staying the same. But I, I, I still see it as a sector that's growing and growing pretty steadily uh, and, and reason to be bullish about it. Yeah. So uh, when you look across the globe, and I don't know if you do this, but is U.S. manufacturing holding on to market share, global manufacturing market share, or are we losing still? I mean, obviously, we lost a, a boatload of share yeah. when China came on the scene in the, in, in, with the WTO in 2001. We got creamed, you know, in the decade or so that followed. Have we stabilized? That share has tend, that sh it's stabilized. It has. Uh, okay. it, it, we obviously, you know, when I came on board, this has nothing to do with my performance, but when we came on board, the U.S. was the number one manufacturer in the world, right? That was one of our talking points. Uh, we, we quickly moved away from that stat because it, it quickly became China, right? Um, uh, and so we, we did lose market share for, for, for many years, but that has stabilized a bit. Right. It, it, and of course, when I say manufacturing, that encompasses a lot of different activities, right? Everything from... we talk about technology to the vehicle industry to furniture to clothing to food yeah. processing to yeah. petroleum refining i mean i can go on and on and on in fact i think i can tell you every single NAICS code would i bet you you know every do you know every NAICS code uh you know, three, don't, ryan don't does quiz, yeah I, I know them in general but don't quiz me on it right now yeah ryan ryan what's three one three three one 
three. See, I tell you, he'll come up with it in five minutes. He'll come back with it, and he won't even he won't Google. I promise. It's not, it's not electrical equipment, is it? I, actually, I, I have no idea. No, <laughs> I don't. Know. I know I three it's, one is manu, manufacturing, but I don't know. I what think it's an undurable good, but I can't. It's an undurable good. Okay. It's probably uh, okay. If I get this, this would be amazing, right? Three one three. I'm gonna say. Hold on, I'm going to look it up to make no, sure. No, hold on, wait, right. wait, okay. wait. I, and I'm not. Look, you can see my hands are right here. I'm not doing anything. Three one three. I'd oh. say that is. Oh. Um, I, I would, I would say <laughs> what? Oh, really? Go for it. Really... Go for it. <laughs> I'm not gonna get it wrong. Uh, I'm gonna say that's leather leather processing. No. Nope. What no. is it? Wait, it is come on. Textile manufacturing. Okay. <laughs> leather. Oh, come on now. Leather processing, <laughs> textile manufacturing. It was pretty close, oh, apparently. Come on. It was close. Right. It's close. It's close. Oh, come on. Chad. Chad. It's pretty close. I, I, I like it. Come yeah. on. And I bet it is leather leather manufacturing in the textile industry. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm impressing myself this podcast. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. That's all. How I'm many uh, trips to Wawa did you make today? Well, I am in Daytona Beach, Florida, home of... Uh, where my wife grew up with, I met my mother-in-law. So there, oh. and believe this or not, there is a beautiful, big Wawa in Daytona Beach, Ormond mm-hmm. Beach. And I went to it this morning, had my hazelnut cut. Co- Do you have Wawa? You have Wawa's in, in DC, don't you, Chad? There is one in the city of, of the, the District of Columbia. That's it. Oh, well, that, we got to change a, that. Yeah. Wawa, come on, man. Do you, Chad, do you like Wawa? Sure. Sure. <laughs> How could he say no? I no, Mark. I, I really don't like coffee, Wawa. If I'm gonna get a coffee, it's probably a Starbucks coffee. But, uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you. I yes, I woke I woke up this morning, six thirty. Got in my uh, car and drove over the or- Ormond Beach uh, Bridge to to the spanking brand new Wawa. Got my coffee. My mother in law, my wife. You know, all good. Um, here, here you go. This is the devoured the Wawa cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. I don't know what they put in the coffee, but you're you're on fire. <laughs> yeah, fire <laughs> right. You got to keep going with that one. Back to the topic at hand. Sorry, <laughs> I, I, we digress. We digress. So, I guess my question was: Is the uh, kind of the strength of the nation's manufacturing base broad based? Is it across all industries, or or some in? I guess tech well, is shining through. I guess yeah, hard, tech, and it's pharma. Tech. You mentioned yeah. any others that Chem- are shining chemical, through? Chemicals, obviously. Well, chemi- part of chemicals is pharma, right? So you got to you got to kind of attribute it to that as well. The number one sector, actually, that has bounced back the most since the pandemic is aerospace. But that has largely to do with the Boeing. aerospace sector being in a different place today than it was yeah. a, a couple of years ago. Well, that's Boeing, right? Uh, I mean, that that's got to be they got a number of companies. Know. So I was be careful there, but yeah. Oh, Boeing, sorry, sorry, like, sorry about that. But they they're <laughs> yes, the largest they're exporter better. in the country. I mean, yeah. they're a big part of manufa- the nation's manufacturing. They're the, you know prowess, really. So yeah. I mean, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, paper textiles tended to to, to lag behind. Um, right, right. Uh, and right. because of the chip shortage, uh, post-pandemic, the motor vehicle sector really struggled this year, right? It's down about 6% in terms of industrial production since January. Uh, but that's that's a unique thing. The, the auto sector actually had was the fastest to bounce back to pre-pandemic levels last summer, right? It's, it's, so this is all about chips and supply chains. More yeah, recently. let's go there because that, that's a great point. I mean, the vehicle industry production is down, but not because there isn't demand. There's like a lot of demand, a lot of pent up demand. We talked about that last week with uh, Elaine Buckberger, GM. It's it's about I, I can't produce in the supply chain issues. Yeah. So uh, we've already kind of danced around this a bit. Uh, but how would you characterize the supply chain problems today? Uh, and are they getting better, not getting better? Where are we in, in this path to normalization in the supply chains. You do get a sense that the ports issue is getting better, right? So that was the conversation three or four months ago. Um, You still have uh, long waits in the ports, but it's not as bad as it was, right? Uh, My view is a a little bit of deja vu all over again. Ryan will love this, right? So uh, you're you're certainly, when you're thinking about Omicron and and what's happening abroad, right? So you have cities that are being shut down again, kind of in, in pockets of Asia, 
that's affecting ports, it's affecting production, and that certainly slows down the supply chain coming into the US. The issue with the ports, uh, in addition to everything, just the volume is also not enough dock workers, right? So that's part, it's, it's a supply chain issue, but it's also a workforce issue. And then once they get it off the boats, there's not enough truck drivers, right? So you have all of these things kind of compounding into a, this larger kind of slowing of the overall process. At the factories themselves, uh, there are there right now, I know you guys cited this number last week from the Household Pulse Survey, 8.8 .8 million, not just manufacturing, but generally 8.8 .8 million yeah. people in the last report that said that they were out sick with COVID or taking care of someone that's COVID, uh, you know, COVID related. Uh, that's also slowed down production. You've seen a couple stories of that more recently too, where that, that's affected overall employment. So in general, you get a sense that the supply chain issues are getting better, and yet there are these lingering workforce and ports and Omicron issues that are kind of plaguing overall production. I did ask on our most recent NAM Outlook survey, when do you expect, so this was in December, right? So we'll be asking this question again in the next week when I ask it again, but um, when do you expect the supply chain issues will abate or, or get better? Um, mm. And 54% and of our members said this year, 2022, but almost all of that was the second half, right? That's so I think 38.8 or whatever was, was the second half of the year. Uh, and that's mostly what I hear from our manufacturers is that there's cautious optimism that supply chain issues will get better in the second half of the year, that some of these port issues and some of the other supply chain issues will, will start getting better. But you have about more, a more, little bit more than a quarter who think it won't get better until next year, the 2023 or later, right? The chip issue that we've talked about several times, it's going to take a while to dig out of that hole, right? It, uh, it's just the volume of chips that you need, electric vehicles, a lot of other, you know, as, as technology gets more sophisticated, you need more chips, right? And so it's going to take a while to dig out of that hole. And the work of work, workforce issues aren't going to go away, right? Um, we aren't going to suddenly overnight get more truck drivers. We're not suddenly overnight going to find these workers uh, for manufacturing and other jobs. And so I think that's more of a structural issue that's going to continue on throughout this year and into next year. So I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic about the supply chain issues, but I think that lingering issue and why actually going back to our earlier conversation, I think inflation will be, even though it is going to improve, it's going to stay a little bit more elevated than we would like is I think those wage pressures are going to continue to hover out there. and It's going to take a while for us to kind of get past it. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, when you say, when you, when, we, when you talked about supply chain issues, you talked about it in the context of, of the ports. Is, is that the, the most significant issue here? It's just really getting things through the ports to... That was a huge bottleneck. It still is a bottleneck. So it's one of the larger bottlenecks that's out there. Um, that obviously is getting better. Yeah. And what, what I what I like to say here is that, you know, just if, if you flash forward a year or two, it'll be interesting to see how many companies take advantage of this opportunity. Right. And say, because some, some companies have seen freight costs go up, not just double or, or triple. Like one company told me their freight costs have gone up eight times. Right. Wow. So you have a lot of small and medium sized manufacturers that, you know, this is like, how am I going to make how can I make payroll with these huge you know, wage increases I have to pay and then you have to pay freight. So I actually think this is a unique opportunity for manufacturers to say, well, maybe I should make it here, right? <laughs> Rather yeah. than shipping it across. And so this yeah. brings up to me the whole reshoring conversation again, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That you're going to have companies that are reevaluating their supply chain and saying, if not the U.S., at least North America, where I don't have to you know, perhaps ship it across the ocean. Uh, and, and so I, I do think that companies have that opportunity now to, to do that, right? You're seeing that a little bit with the CHIPS Act, right? We're, we're seeing a lot of, of increased production in the U.S. for chip production, right? To kind of bring some of that back home or to create new uh, opportunities here. But I think every manufacturer is going to be, you know, every, every manufacturer tells you they're reevaluating the supply chain. Uh, but it means that means different things to different companies. But I, I think this is a unique opportunity. And I think policymakers need to focus on that to say, okay, this is, this is a, an opportunity for more reshoring. What can I do to incentivize that so that we can have more resilient supply chains moving forward, but also have more production here in general, right? 
Uh, and we, I think that, that that onus really is on policymakers to to disclose, not mess it up. I guess. When manufacturers say reshoring, do they mean U.S. or do they mean kind of North America or do they mean not Asia well, or what do they mean exactly? Or is it all it, over the? It all traditionally over the place? is U.S. Although uh -huh. I, I would argue that North America benefits from that in general, right? So Canada, yeah. and Mexico. Um, yeah. And so a lot of the reshoring that's taken place probably has come to the to North America at writ large. But you still see foreign direct investment in the U.S. in manufacturing hit record highs, right? So you're still seeing a lot of investment here that's taking place. So you, your sense is because of the supply chain issues that were laid bare by the pandemic, there are probably issues there that just were never stressed. And now that we stress the system, we see you know where the bottlenecks are. You're saying because of that, we you think that there will be significantly more investment in manufacturing in the United States going yes. forward. Yes. Yeah. Now, companies were reevaluating the supply chain anyway, right? There's just been a whole host of events over the last five to ten years, yeah. right? Whether it's flooding, Going back to the Japanese earthquake, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then so the trade like, war, right? Everyone trade was war, about, right? Yeah. But I think this unique opportunity here, especially given where freight costs have gone, I think uh, companies are going to look at that in a different way. Yeah. Great. I guess the the one other constraint, though, coming home is labor, right? I mean manufacturing had a very severe labor shortage even before the pandemic because you had yes. a, a lot of older workers, boomers that are retiring, taking a lot of uh, skills with them. Younger workers had not been going into manufacturing. And that was before the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic has exacerbated all that. So is, did I characterize that correctly? Is That, that, a, is, an, that is very accurate. That's right? very accurate. Yeah. Uh, you know, Manufacturers are really worried about where that next generation of workers is going to come from, right? Um, we've got to identify, according to Deloitte and the Manufacturing Institute, you know, more than two million workers over the next decade, right, to fill those jobs. The people who are leaving and retiring, where is that? Those, where are those new people going to come from, right? And so we've been trying to encourage more women to go into manufacturing, to more military veterans, right, to encourage more diversity in general. Um, and as it relates to older workers, uh, manufacturers tell us they don't want their people who are nearing retirement to leave, right? Because they don't want to see that talent walk out the door, but they also don't have someone necessarily there to kind of take them, take that place, right? And so we've done a lot, lot lately on retention, and we did a, a study with AARP on multi generational teams that came out a couple months ago where you could try to incorporate different generations to try to increased productivity there. But, you know, this, this is a huge issue. Um, it doesn't seem like there's an obvious solution here, right? Because this is the, you got labor shortages all across the board. Again, pre-pandemic, this was happening and post-pandemic, very much, you know, obvious. The only way a, out, it feels part like- Part of it is a perceptions it, challenge, right? Perceptions, people, okay. People, when, they, when you think about manufacturing, you have this perception out there that manufacturing is dark, dirty, or dangerous, or whatever, or, 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 you just think, well, it's not cool, or it's, it's you know, I, I want to go yeah. work for Google or, or, or Meta or one of those other Although companies. Although they're, right? they're becoming manufacturers to some degree too, and aren't I, they? And I think, yeah, yeah and I think yeah. what you have to recognize is that manufacturing has also become very high tech, right? Very advanced. Uh, in many ways, there's a blurring of the lines. Some of those companies, mm -hmm. you know, Microsoft is a member, right? Uh, some of those companies make more mo money from services than they do from goods, right? So there is this blurring of the lines between what is a manufacturer and what isn't. Uh, and we're competing for talent with some of those folks, right? And, and, and so I think just recognizing that there are some fairly unique opportunities there. It's a high paying job. It can be a fun job. Um, I think th that's part of the challenge that we kind of need to overcome. Uh, we have an initiative called Creators Wanted, which is a bus that goes around the country, kind of like our, it's kind of our Got Milk campaign, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where they, you know, invite kids in and, and see how cool manufacturing is. We, you know, yeah. we do Manufacturing Day where Manufacturers open their doors for for young young adults and kids in school, and, and uh, I think all of those things are really just to try to change perceptions about you know just how cool manufacturing can be. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's also so much technological innovation going on in manufacturing uh, that you know is really critical to our kind of long term competitive advantage and you know just the overall the nation's overall health. I mean, I just was looking at some of the ro advances in robotics that's going on. It's just incredibly amazing, you know. So so. That goes back to Ryan's number from the game, right? All yeah, of the exactly. investments in R&D and, and yeah. productivity and automation. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I read, I think it was a story in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago, 
uh, more uh, robots were sold last year than in any other year, right? If you, if you kind of take the first three quarters and kind of annualize that, we sold more robots than ever, right? Automation is clearly the key. Um, and, and it means that manufacturers are trying to, to fill those gaps wherever they can, but it also exacerbates the skills gap cap problem, right? Because if you are using yeah. some of these newer technologies, right, uh, whether that's 5G or augmented reality or, or whatever it might be, uh, it means you need a different type of worker, right? It needs a more high paying worker, but it also means you're competing now against with all those tech guys, right? <laughs> right. So you're, that, that struggle for talent is, is one that is probably exacerbated by the automation that's going into the plants right now. Well, so my takeaway here is you're optimistic about manufacturing, uh, you know, particularly in the context of uh, the pandemic and the supply chain issues of, of manufacturing's coming home. Uh, you know, obviously, lawmakers, policymakers are focused on this, and you know, uh, are going to are working to try to incent uh, uh, bringing that home and making our supply chains more resilient. And uh, the 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 issue here in the near term, obviously, is you know working through the supply chain issues globally. But longer run, it's about the labor supply. You know, where do we get the folks that are going to have the skills and the talents necessary to uh, to work in this uh, sector? That did I get that you know roughly right? That is exact. I couldn't have said it better. Okay, <laughs> Ryan, did you hear that? This is like this is the this is my show. I got I nailed everything throughout this show. You got it, right? Do you agree? He's shaking his head no. No, no, you had a. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. was your best podcast. Best podcast, I, I, I have to say. Just don't let it go to your head. Okay, that's fair. It already has, but you know. I, I know, I know. <laughs> but Chris, Chris, and I are here. This is what we're here for to help. Yeah, you know, right. Bring well, it down. Now, now, <laughs> yeah. now that you say that, before we, we let Chad go, uh, you know, what would you? Is there any questions or uh, things that you would like to bring up uh, to Chad? Any 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 particular issues that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? I guess uh, from my perspective, it sounds like um, manufacturing is going to return, but uh, it's certainly going to return to the U.S. in a different form than it left, right? So very high tech. So as you talk about that reshoring, it sounds like yeah, we'll get all the uh, the high the highest high tech firms coming to the U.S., but then perhaps the ones that are still more labor intensive, they they may still go to Mexico, right? So. I, uh, or other or other neighboring countries, if there is some type of reshoring is that your your sense of things or in general uh in general but but i think even even in the apparel and textile sector you're seeing uh you know production return to the u.s because of automation right and so i think that there are certainly opportunities here in the u.s even in those sectors which we might have kind of in the past back when we were studying economics in grad school or whatever said yeah those those are going to go away right I, I think that there are unique opportunities for some of those industries which are more labor intensive to come back because of technology because they perhaps need less labor than they used to ryan anything you, you got the you know the uh, the world's biggest brain on manufacturing mm -hmm. sitting here right at this podcast anything you'd like to know i, I thought the biggest hurdle for reshoring was the age of the capital stock for manufacturing which is in the u.s it's pretty old so that'd be a big upfront investment for manufacturers do you think that's you know, a big hurdle or there's ways around it? It can be a hurdle, uh, but but keep in mind, you know, certainly you can incentivize that through tax policy, right? We've done a lot to encourage more investments, you know, certainly accelerating those investments that has helped, right? Mm -hmm. I think the other thing to watch, and we didn't really talk about it here, is regular the regulatory environment over the next few years is, is has clearly shifted as well. And companies are looking at sustainability in ways that they might not have looked at it five years ago, right? They'll see and, and being net zero between now and, and, you know, 2050. So all of that really is going to need modernization and, and newer equipment, right? And so I think you're already, you're seeing, you know, companies have already done a lot in that space as it relates to climate, but I think you're going to see them, there's a pivot here where companies are really going to be looking at their facilities and wanting to get to net zero, wanting to be sustainable, wanting to be climate friendly. And I think that will also shift and has shifted this conversation in a way that, again, we wouldn't have described it, say, five, 10 years ago. You know, it really feels like there's got to be a lot of investment here, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of re just reshoring because of all the issues, 
the need to focus on on labor productivity given the labor supply issues, you know, uh, the need to focus on um, uh, lowering your uh, manufacturing's carbon footprint, uh, given all the kind of scrutiny on climate change, this feels like there's going to be a lot of investment. So that number that Ryan called out on intellectual property, which, which is more than just manufacturing, obviously, but yeah. manufacturing is a big chunk of it. That feels like that's going to be a big number for a while to come. I think manufacturing accounts for 58 percent of R and D yeah. in the private yeah, sector. Exactly. So yeah, so yeah. it definitely has a big impact yeah. there. Great. Well, Chad, this this was a wonderful conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, taking time out uh, of your day and and uh, helping us out here. Uh, very kind of you. And uh, to the listener, uh, a, please, if you have uh, suggestions for future podcasts, go to economy.com and you'll see a, a place there to give us your view and let us know. Uh, it, you know, we love to hear from you. If you have a review of the podcast, any suggestions I get, we, I constantly get suggestions from people. Someone told me that we should begin with the game before we start talking, going in deep into the statistics because it, you know, kind of messes up the game. But, uh, you know, I hear all kinds of suggestions. So please uh, fire away. Uh, we're very interested in hearing uh, your, uh, your comments. So with that, uh, we'll call it a podcast. Thank you very much.